when our programs. It was started in Indonesia in 2006 and was launched by Larry Campbell, president of ICPI at the time. This program was fully supported by the Nippon Foundation, one of ICPI international partners. The reason why ICPI and the Nippon Foundation developed higher education program in East Asia region was that for decades, campaigns and advocacy upon inclusive education were only done for primary and secondary education. At the same time, young people with visual impairment as community asset should also or could also continue studying to university. Before having higher education implemented in ICPI regional partners, students with visual impairment who studying in university had to struggle very difficult on their own. Universities did not have the awareness and sense of responsibility that they should provide reasonable accommodation for students with visual impairment. If students obtain services, usually these services came from resource centers that dedicated for them. Ladies and gentlemen, this situation of course had significant impact towards students with visual impairment. Only few of them could continue and finish studying in higher education because studying in university is very, very challenging for them. When higher education program was implemented in Indonesia in the first year, ICPI and its local partners, they were Pertuni, the Indonesian Blind Union, as well as the Mitra Netra Foundation, these parties decided to pioneer the program in two big cities in Indonesia. They were Jakarta and Bandung. Within these two cities, this program established the Disabled Student Service Centers in selected universities partners. The function of this service center was providing assistive technology devices and equipment to support the independence of students with visual impairment in preceding their study in university. Because of the availability of these assistive technology devices and equipment, students with visual impairment were able to get access to books or references they were able to finish and submit their assignments, including thesis on time. And for sure, they were able to finish their degree on time as well. After succeeding in implementing higher education program in those two cities in Indonesia, then ICPI and the Nippon Foundation decided to extend the program to other cities throughout Indonesia, as well as to other countries throughout East Asia region. Currently, after 15 years of the program implementation, higher education program reached seven countries in East Asia region. They are Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam, Cambodia, Lao PDR, Myanmar, and Mongolia. Ladies, gentlemen, friends, and colleagues, we have proven that higher education had succeeded to encourage parents to brought their children with visual impairment to school. We convinced parents that bringing their children with visual impairment to school is very important, very valuable, and very useful because after finishing school, children with visual impairment could continue studying to university. And the impact of this situation is that 
young people with visual impairment might be able to have more job opportunities in the future. This situation, of course, increased the number of students with visual impairment who enrolled in universities in the countries where this program has been implemented. For Indonesia, higher education program had succeeded to encourage the government to develop policies in inclusive education. It started by the issue of the Ministry of Education regulation on inclusive higher education. Then the government brought the mandate of inclusive higher education to stronger and higher level of education by inserting the mandate into the new disability law of Indonesia, law number eight of 2016. We were very grateful that the Nippon Foundation has such strong commitment to fully support this program. And since 2015, higher education program had started to reach the area of employment, the next challenging area after education. Ladies and gentlemen, now I would like to invite my colleague from Vietnam, asking him to share their achievement through the implementation of higher education. Dang Hui Phuc, the executive director of Sao Mai Computer Center for the Blind, Vietnam. Phuc, please, time is yours. Thanks, Aria. Hi, everyone. Continuing from Aria's presentation, I would like to share with you our higher education related work in three main areas. Number one, accessible academic materials production. Number two, technology application for more job opportunities. And number three, regional collaboration programs as examples of the effectiveness of the partnerships. First, about the academic materials production. From the beginning, the project recognized that to provide accessible materials for visually impaired students and to do so on time and in the formats that met their needs was one of the key factors we needed to address. The question then was, how do we collect requested book titles, create an effective workflow to produce the titles, and efficiently distribute them to the students? This all needed to be considered carefully from the start. We reached out to both direct and indirect beneficiaries. This included developing a network to connect blind students with each other while simultaneously working with university, the Ministry of Education, and organizations of and for the blind. This was done not only to collect book titles, but also to strengthen many other important activities of the project, such as raising awareness, promoting public policy changes, and conducting training activities. We developed an online library where both students, university faculty can request an accessible version of a book and download it. I am happy to say that today there are several other organizations in Vietnam producing accessible books. Therefore, we regularly share out catalog and our to-do book list so that we avoid any wasteful duplication of effort. In terms of the accessible materials production workflow, we have a team aside for that work, and we also use volunteers to support certain steps in the process. The main production tasks include scanning and recognizing text, editing and proofreading, conversion into accessible formats, and a quality check before final release. Book formats include audio, daisy, EPUB, large print, and Braille. In our efforts to both improve materials production and support visually impaired students, we have also developed new software such as the Salmai Braille used to edit and translate text, math, tactile graphics, 
and music into Braille. The SM Music Reader app to have reading music scores. It's the first fully accessible music reading app for both Android and iOS platforms. Useful not only for the blind, but also for the sighted. We are grateful to the Nippon Foundation and the Overbrook School for the Blind for the funding support to develop these two software products. The important role of existing technology is clearly proved by these efforts. Now, let me share with you some other project activities that we have undertaken to promote equal access to higher education and to increase job opportunities for visually impaired graduates. Through our year, we regularly conduct a range of technology trainings for different groups of blind students, including high school students to prepare them for entrance into the higher education, current enrolled students to learn about and slash or update them on latest existing technology tools to empower and improve their academic performance. And for job seekers, which might include both currently enrolled and graduate students, we help them master technology skills related to their specific job requirements. We believe that soft skills training is essential to improve capacity in both inclusive education and in job settings. So we often conduct trainings and related activities such as independent living skills, preparation for employment and real life experiences. In addition to traditional job in mainstream companies, we have developed on-site job trainings in cooperation with employers such as telesales, online marketing, customer support service, etc. We also conduct trainings for students who want to be self-employed through online work. Technology applications are always a key part of our trainings related to job preparation. Over the past few years, we have successfully referred and placed hundreds of blind job seekers in employment in various mainstream sectors, such as working in insurance companies, call centers, sales, software development, etc. Finding a job is a challenge, but job retention can also be a challenge for some. In recognition of this factor, we have built close relationship with both visually impaired employees and their employers to provide any support and consultation that may be needed. The last point I'm going to just share with you is the development of the Myanmar TTS, text to speech engine. The Nippon Foundation, Overbrook International, and the ICEBI Higher Education Project have fostered many regional level cooperations, and the Myanmar TTS development is one of them. As you know, a text to speech engine is a core technology to be used with screen reading software to provide speech for visually impaired computer users. So with this first Myanmar TTS release, all blind users in Myanmar now have very free access to read and write documents in the Burmese language. The TTS that we have developed was done through great teamwork and runs on both Android and Windows platforms. I think I should read a few quotes from the beneficiaries rather than talking more about its features or technical things. However, before that, I would like to briefly introduce supporters and partners of this project. On behalf of the development team, we extend sincere thanks to the Nippon Foundation, ICEVI, and Overbrook International Program. The project was implemented with the collaboration of teams from Myanmar and Vietnam, including Samai Center for the Blind from Vietnam, in charge of technical solutions and software coding, Myanmar Association of the Blind, testing and conducting trainings for end users, Myanmar Assistive Technology Research and Development Center, working with Burmese language specialists, providing data, testing, and distributing the product. Dagan University, University of Computer Studies, 
of Yangon and Mandalay and other individuals for their language consultation and data sharing. Before closing my presentation part, I would like to read three short quotes from the direct beneficiaries of the TTS that again demonstrate the value of cross-border partnerships. First quote from Alex Visa Nara commented via our SM Myanmar TTS site on Google Play Store. Quote, we have been waiting for this application so long, now it comes true. End quote. The second quote. My name is Tan Tai from Kimidai School for the Blind, Yangon. I graduated as a history major at Western University, Yangon. This Myanmar TTS application promotes the use of Android phones even for those who did not have chance to attend school. Before this application was released, our blind community in Myanmar was so small, but now we can communicate and explore throughout the world as we do not have language barrier anymore, end quote. And the third quote from Ms. An Chen On, who graduated from the Mandalay University of Foreign Languages, majoring in English linguistics, and who is currently working as a freelance translator. Quote, I couldn't be able to work like this without Burmese TTS. It has brought me not only language accessibility, but also independence and confidence. So my heartfelt thanks go to each and everyone who has contributed to the development of this TTS and code. With that, I would like to conclude my presentation and thank you for your interest and attention. Thank you very much, Fook, for sharing with us your achievement through higher education program, which had been implemented in Vietnam. It was very fantastic. Now I would like to invite another ICPI Higher Education Program country partner, RBI Resources for the Blind from the Philippines. Amy Mojica, the Executive Director of RBI, and Marlo Lucas, one of RBI's team who is responsible to coordinate higher education program in the Philippines. Amy and Marlo, Please, time is yours now. Thank you very much, Arya. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody, no matter where you are right now. I am Ami Mojica from Resources for the Blind Incorporated from the Philippines, and together with my colleague, Mr. Marlo Lucas, we'll be sharing with you all the tremendous work done by ICBI in our country. I want to touch briefly on the impact of ICEBI in our organization, in particular how ICEBI helped us build and develop a long-term partnership with national and local government agencies in the Philippines. Then Mr. Marlo Lucas will talk about the components of our higher education program in the Philippines. Let's begin. 1998 when we started our partnership with the Nippon Foundation. Back then, we worked with 78 college students from 28 state colleges and universities nationwide. Through the years, we can proudly say that ICEBI not only empowers students, but as well as our organization. We learned so much from ICEBI, but I can share two important elements that help us attract partnership and sustain services that we are providing. One is engagement and connection. Once we started, we become the voice of the students. That means we must advocate and engage our target agents. Our target audience must know what we can offer to them and how we can help them. Who are our target audience? Our target audience are, of course, the students and their families. 
the teachers and professors, the school administrators, and other service providers in the community who can support our students. As a result, we managed to convince people's disability group, like the parents advocates for visually impaired children, the people's disability of peers office and local provinces and municipalities, the National Council for Disability Affairs Office, which is a national government agency, and of course, the student support group. We have strengthened our partnership with government institutions in charge of education, like the Department of Education, the Commission on Higher Education, the Technical Education and Skills Development Authority, and the Department of Science and Technology, in particular, the Science Education Institute. When we focus on employment, we work with the Department of Labor and Employment and the PESO local office in provinces and municipalities. For advocacy, we have managed to work with the Commission on Human Rights and the Intellectual Property Office of the Philippines and private institutions like IBM. Other BPO offices that we work with are Accenture, Sutherland, and we do have global solutions. Second is scaling up. Through the guidance of ICDI leaders, especially during the preparations of proposals, and from the regular monitoring and evaluations conducted, we identified activities that we should grow larger or increase or enhance. Activities that can be supported by local partners and transferred to them, and activities within the programs that needs more nurturing. From prioritizing to strategy setting, we replicated our activities and secure funding locally. For example, the STEM teacher education. It is now being implemented by the Department of Science and Technology under the Science Education Institute. We started this training with the Department of Education. Then it catches the attention of the OSD or the Department of Science and Technology. They observe us during the science camp, and the following year, they provided the budget. Now, the OST is fully in charge of this activity, introducing the STEM curriculum produced by ICEDI nationwide. Another example is the computer ice camp, which used to be entirely funded by ONET and ICEDI is now 75% funded by IBM Philippines. We used to conduct it in Manila, but to increase the participants, we are now providing it to Visayas and Mindanao regions face-to-face -face or online. To conclude, to be successful in working with partners, we need to learn to maintain engagement and connections with people and organizations who can help influence our communities, our society. They need to know our program outcomes, the challenges that we are encountering, and how they can participate. We also learn to regularly evaluate our program to determine what growth needs, what activity can be transferred and delivered to partners, and what needs further nurturing. This is important as we continue to advocate the educational rights of children with blindness and low vision. Everyone is entitled to education and everyone is entitled to continuing education. Education empower us to change our lives and we can work together to make it happen for all children who are blind or low vision. Thank you very much for listening. I now introduce my friend, Mr. Marlo Lucas, to continue our presentation. Marlo, please. A pleasant day to everyone. Uh, today, I will be sharing with you how Resources for the Blind Incorporated, or RBI, 
works for the higher education programs toward attaining an inclusive job market in the Philippines and coping up in the COVID-19 pandemic, supported by the Nippon Foundation through the International Council for Education of People with Visual Impairment, or ICVI, with a goal in expanding educational access and full inclusion in higher education with visual impairment. Just so you know, Masads is the number one job for people who are blind in our country. Uh, most of them work in decent clinics and shopping centers and institutions or in places accessible by the public. New opportunities arise with the beginning of business process outsourcing or BPO in 1992. And three years after Congress passed in the Philippine Economic Zone Authority. As a result, this has opened many doors for international BPOs in the country. Consequently, many young people who are blind and low vision are proficient on the use of computer with the help of a screen reader. So thank you to our partners, Overbrook Nippon Network on Educational Technology, on NET and the IBM Philippines for funding our computerized camp, which began in 2001. So how the higher education program started in the Philippines? As mentioned by Ms. Mojica, in 2008, few blind students are pursuing higher education and they mainly follow traditional courses such as education and social work courses. Colleges and universities at that time were hesitant to accommodate visually impaired students at their schools. So we listened to students and their families, their desires and challenges, but could not enroll in the universities and take the degree of their choice. We also engaged and connect. RBI began writing to colleges and universities advocating for right to education of these learners. The tagline of SDG Making It Right were adopted in the trainings conducted for colleges and universities entitled Making It Work, Educating Visually Impaired Students in Your Classroom. Content mainly focuses on making the curriculum accessible which were presented by successful students, professors, and demonstration. Gradually, we noticed an increase of enrolled students in different universities and colleges. And we model a student resource center. RBI, through the ICBI project, set up several student center to which students secure accessible learning materials and receive technical support on the use of assistive technology. Teachers, professors, and other service providers also utilizes the center to effectively support the students who are blind and low vision. After sending them to school, we must then ensure that they will be able to obtain employment. The Philippine Republic Act 7277 a Magna Carta for Persons with Disabilities guarantees the capacitating and inclusion of blind and low vision into the mainstream society by stressing the importance of the rehabilitation, self-development, and self-reliance. Some of its noteworthy efforts in improving the employment opportunities, including the development and implementation of training programs, the allocation of jobs in many government agencies and the provision of attractive incentives to private entities who will hire persons with disabilities. The COVID-19 crisis has disproportionately affected persons with disabilities, in particular, those who are visually impaired as they are among those who have been displaced Next, following the closure of the employment downsizing of some industries in the Philippines. On the other hand, students in basic and higher education in both public and private institutions 
we're confronted with the demand to have personal assistive devices and to be eligible in technologies as classes shifted from face-to-face -to, -face to modular and online classes. Seeing this uh, reality, the RBI and its partners strive to surpass the barriers of the pandemic outbreak. Online platforms for trainings and seminars were the only option left to pursue interventions. Fortunately, adapting such platforms was no longer took a lengthy transition period due to the fact that most youth who are blind and low vision have already increased their technological orientation by participating to several RBI, ICBI, and ONNET activities. Being said these challenges, our students can still opt to choose whatever is available learning modalities provided by the schools so they can continue their studies during pandemic. Employment at the peak of the pandemic was still possible and it's advantageous to some visually impaired. Some employers are also committed to helping uh, people with visual impairment to obtain gainful employment with their own companies. Our long-standing partner of Resources for the Blind and this employment advocacy, their business is always ready to hire people with vision loss. In fact, their assistant vice president in human resources department is reassuring that persons with visual impairment may apply at the company anytime and they're willing to outsource the list of openings to RBI. This assurance resulted in the desire of some visually impaired persons to apply to their company, resulting in the hiring of three visually impaired person. And I want to share with you the collective praises of our visually impaired who were hired during the pandemic. And it is a truly a blessing to have had gainful employment, especially at the height of the pandemic by which everyone is economically affected. And here are testimonies of our past uh, trainees. It's quite empowering having a regular job in the comfort of my own home. Another benefit I get is that I feel dignified with the difficulty of schooling that I had been through. Next is right now that I am already employed, I feel that I am able to use my skills. I feel that I am able to help, that I am able to contribute to the society and that I am able to help other people, especially to the company and to the blind people like me in making a difference. I also feel that having this work gives me purpose in life and that I am able to fulfill my dreams and goals in life to help and contribute to other things and to other people. And I would like to conclude my remarks with a quote from one of the visually impaired who has inspired many of our countries visually impaired. And according to Abdullah Sistapilin, graduated cum laude, now a blind sped teacher in Sambuanga City, COVID is a test of C-O-V-I-D with the acronym Choices, Opportunities, Versatility, innovation and determination. Choices make up who we are. Opportunities are not to be waited. It is created. Versatility helps us to adjust to challenging situations. Innovations enables us to take the opportunities. A determination will enable us to continue, although it may seem difficult. Now is not the time to surrender or to give up. The complexity and challenges of COVID-19, which continue to challenge us, have put us all to the test in ways we never anticipated or even thought possible. However, Resources for the Blind and its partner organizations have approached the situation with positivity, creativity, and determination to put programs and systems safely back into operation. Thank you.
Thank you, Ami and Marlo, for your inspiring presentation. Ladies, gentlemen, colleagues, and friends, developing inclusive higher education system needs such long time. It could not happen only in several weeks or months. It took years. It took years for us until we have the government regulations and law. And it took years for us to see the impact of this program towards students with visual impairment. Once again, we would like to sincerely thank to the Nippon Foundation for this fully support for higher education program in East Asia region. As the moderator of this session, I also would like to thank you all for participating in this session. I hope this is very valuable for you all. Let's keep doing good works for our younger generation with visual impairment to make schools and universities become inclusive place to study. Thank you. All right. Ladies, gentlemen, and colleagues, we just listened to a video presenting how ICPI Higher Education Program had been implemented in Southeast Asia region, especially in Indonesia, the Philippines, and Vietnam. Now, we still have one more resource person within this webinar. He, he comes from Spain. He's a university professor, Professor Rafael Carvalho Delgado. He's going to present how uh, higher education uh, access for students with visual impairment in Spain. Professor Rafael Carvalho, please, time is yours. And your time allocation is 15 minutes. Hola a todos. Eh, muchísimas gracias, Aria, por la presentación eh, y a todos los organizadores de, de este gran evento por, por invitarme ¿no? a compartir eh, bueno, mi investigación y mi experiencia con, con todos vosotros. Bien, voy a eh, presentarles una presentación que tenéis aquí disponible en la que podéis ir viendo eh, de qué voy a hablar. Bueno, eh, algunos de los compañeros ya habéis hablado de eh, ese acceso y ese, esas mejoras que son necesarias para la inclusión de los estudiantes con discapacidad visual en la universidad. Eh, en España la situación realmente no es diferente. De hecho, los, los datos indican que eh, los estudiantes con discapacidad comparten eh, las mismas dificultades en las eh, instituciones de enseñanza superior en eh, todos o casi todos los, los países del mundo. ¿no? Eh, estos programas que, que ustedes han presentado son muy interesantes y eh, además, como, como vosotros sabréis, hay un elemento fundamental o un protagonista fundamental en las universidades para que esa inclusión realmente eh, sea eficaz. Ese protagonista, esas personas, son los eh, profesores. Los profesores universitarios tienen un papel fundamental en los procesos de inclusión educativa de los estudiantes con discapacidad visual en la universidad. Y es precisamente sobre ellos, sobre los que eh, voy a hablar ahora. Eh, los estudiantes, eh, no solamente con, con discapacidad visual, sino con todo tipo de discapacidad, de discapacidades, eh, encuentran en las, en las universidades eh, diferentes barreras, dificultades, que hacen que estudiar pues, sea más complejo que para, otros, que para otros compañeros sin discapacidad. Entre ellos, pues las infraestructuras o las construcciones inaccesibles o poco adaptadas, materiales 
no adaptados, metodologías que no permiten su participación en clase, eh, complejos trámites burocráticos y, sobre todo, una falta de sensibilidad por parte de la comunidad universitaria y también por parte del profesorado, así como su falta de formación. Si nos centramos en el papel del profesorado, los estudiantes con discapacidad visual normalmente indican que eh, existen unas actitudes negativas por parte de, del profesorado hacia las personas con, con discapacidad, que también eh, el propio profesorado no conoce la normativa universitaria sobre la discapacidad. Las universidades españolas tienen una normativa que regula los derechos de los estudiantes con discapacidad y en muchas ocasiones los profesores no conocen esta, esta normativa, esta legislación. También desconocen los servicios de atención al alumnado con discapacidad. Todas las universidades en España, al igual que en otros países, eh, tienen un eh, servicio de apoyo para las personas con discapacidad que también ofrece asesoramiento a los profesores que tienen estudiantes con discapacidad, incluidos los estudiantes con discapacidad visual. Pero en muchas ocasiones los profesores también desconocen este tipo de servicios de las propias universidades en las que trabajan. Y sobre todo destaca una falta de formación, una falta de conocimiento sobre cómo desarrollar una enseñanza inclusiva y cómo ajustar sus métodos y sus recursos a los estudiantes con discapacidad. Eh, frente a esta situación, eh, mi equipo de investigación, bueno, es un equipo eh, de mm, diferentes investigadores que pertenecemos a diferentes áreas de conocimiento y somos de diferentes universidades españolas. Eh, nosotros nos dedicamos al el, el estudio de las experiencias de los estudiantes con discapacidad en la universidad. No solo con discapacidad visual, sino de todos los tipos de discapacidad. Entonces, frente a esta situación, hemos seguido un recorrido eh, lógico desde el año 2011 en el que tuvimos nuestro, nuestro primer gran proyecto de investigación. En ese primer proyecto, eh, que duró cuatro años, de 2011 a 2014, eh, se titulaba Barreras y ayudas que los estudiantes con discapacidad identifican en la universidad. En este proyecto eh, lo que hicimos fue entrevistar a un total de 44 estudiantes con discapacidad, entre ellos muchos estudiantes con, con discapacidad visual, con eh, al, algunos con discapacidad visual leve, moderada y otros incluso tenían pues, ceguera total. ¿no? Eh, y quisimos conocer desde su experiencia en la universidad cuáles eran las dificultades y las ayudas, es decir, los aspectos positivos y negativos que encontraban en la universidad como institución. Eh, eh, los datos fueron claros y coincidían, como digo, eh, con otros, otras muchas investigaciones a nivel internacional. Eh, los estudiantes señalaban, además de todas esas dificultades que he comentado al principio de mi, de mi, de mi ponencia, eh, que había una gran falta de formación por parte del profesorado. Es decir, había mm, profesores que decían que no era su competencia tener que hacer cambios para eh, las necesidades de esos estudiantes. Otros señalaban eh, o mostraban malas actitudes. Incluso había algunos que se negaban, por ejemplo, a permitir que utilizaran recursos, eh, dispositivos tecnológicos, ¿no? o que se negaban a que un estudiante con discapacidad visual pudiese eh, grabar la sesión en audio con una grabadora. ¿no? Entonces nos encontrábamos ante una situación en la que los propios profesores estaban suponiendo un, una barrera para el aprendizaje de los propios estudiantes con, con discapacidad. A raíz de estos, de estos resultados decidimos en un nuevo proyecto que tuvimos al año siguiente de terminar el anterior, eh, decidimos diseñar, desarrollar y evaluar 
un programa de formación para los profesores universitarios, con la intención de enseñarles a dar una respuesta educativa inclusiva a los estudiantes con discapacidad. Ese proyecto es el que veis ahí, caminando hacia la inclusión social y educativa en la universidad. Y lo que hicimos fue desarrollar un programa de formación con una duración de seis meses, un programa de formación en la modalidad B-Learning, semipresencial, en la que le enseñábamos eh, los fundamentos de la educación inclusiva, eh, a realizar ajustes, a diseñar materiales para estudiantes con discapacidad y a aplicar el diseño universal de aprendizaje. Una vez finalizamos este proyecto, comenzamos en el, que, el, el actual, o el que estamos cerrando ahora, ya que una vez conocíamos eh, la voz del, de, del alumnado y habíamos dado respuesta a esas necesidades de formación del profesorado, quisimos conocer algo que mmm, no suele prestar mucha atención en la investigación. Es decir, la investigación sobre discapacidad se suele centrar en lo que los, lo que los estudiantes necesitan, las, los problemas, las dificultades de los estudiantes con discapacidad. Pero nosotros quisimos saber si había profesores que realmente sí eran inclusivos, profesores que sí desarrollaban una pedagogía inclusiva en la universidad y que se preocupaban por la inclusión de los estudiantes con discapacidad. Por eso pusimos en marcha el tercer proyecto, Pedagogía Inclusiva en la Universidad, Narrativas del Profesorado, que es el proyecto del que os voy a hablar a continuación. Con ese proyecto pretendíamos conocer cómo, qué y por qué lo hace el profesorado que desarrolla una pedagogía inclusiva en la universidad. ¿Cómo contactamos con los profesores participantes? Bueno, pues, en primer lugar, contactamos con los eh, servicios de apoyo al alumnado con discapacidad de un total de 10 universidades españolas. Entonces, a estos servicios les pedimos que si podían difundir entre todos los estudiantes con discapacidad de esa universidad la información sobre el proyecto, solicitando a los estudiantes que nos facilitaran el nombre y el contacto de aquellos profesores que hubiesen eh, influido positivamente en su trayectoria universitaria. Es decir, que nos diesen los nombres de eh, los mejores profesores que habían tenido y que desarrollaban eh, prácticas educativas inclusivas. Finalmente, cuando, después de terminar todo este proceso, eh, contamos con la participación de un total de 109 profesores de toda España, de 10 universidades diferentes y representantes de todas las áreas de conocimiento incluso de ciencias experimentales y enseñanzas técnicas, que son las áreas de conocimiento donde los estudiantes con discapacidad identifican mayores problemas. Eh, una vez teníamos la selección de los, de los profesores, eh, si, seguimos una metodología cualitativa y, realiza, y realizamos dos entrevistas individuales con cada uno de los, dos, de los profesores. Una sobre las creencias y los conocimientos que tenían sobre la discapacidad y otras sobre cómo diseñaban y desarrollaban qué acciones eh, ponían en práctica para mm, fomentar la inclusión de los estudiantes con discapacidad. Entonces, obtuvimos eh, unos resultados muy interesantes sobre eh, el punto de vista de docentes inclusivos. Por un lado, hay que destacar eh, la primera vez que estos profesores tuvimos, tuvieron un estudiante con discapacidad en clase, sin tener formación previa. Eh, por un lado, decían que en su, en su mayor parte habían acudido a los servicios de apoyo de la, de la universidad para que le diesen indicaciones sobre qué métodos y qué recursos o qué ajustes podían realizar para atender a las necesidades de esos estudiantes. Pero por otro lado, en esa primera vez tomaban conciencia de que no tenían conocimientos como profesores para eh, dar respuesta realmente a esas necesidades. 
uno de, uno de los profesores comentaba, como aparece esa cita que aparece ahí abajo, decía, la primera vez que tuve en clase un, a una alumna con discapacidad visual y sobre todo en el examen me sentí con carencias importantes. Vi que me faltaban conocimientos y que me faltaban herramientas. Es decir, decían que no sabían cómo responder realmente a esas necesidades. Con el tiempo fueron eh, recibiendo formación, formación tomando conciencia de que necesitaban saber eh, atender a todos sus estudiantes. Entonces, aquí eh, aparece una selección de eh, las acciones que estos profesores ponían en práctica cuando tenían estudiantes con discapacidad y concretamente ahora veremos con discapacidad visual. Al inicio del curso eh, comentaban que lo que hacían era conocer al alumno, ¿no? eh, personalizar la enseñanza. Muchas veces eh, la, la respuesta más fácil para un, alumno, para un estudiante con discapacidad es conocerlo, preguntar qué necesita, porque sin hablar con él no sabemos qué ajustes tenemos que realizar o qué necesita el alumno para poder aprender y participar. Eh, mostrarse abierto y flexible, hacer todos los cambios que sean necesarios y ofrecer todos los ajustes que el alumno requiera en la materia. En los métodos y los materiales, eh, los profesores inclusivos comentan que suelen utilizar métodos de enseñanza participativos, basados en una enseñanza activa, con el fin de promover la inclusión social de los estudiantes con discapacidad dentro del grupo. Eh, y además, eh, normalmente y sobre todo para los estudiantes con discapacidad visual, pretendían ofrecer todo el material de la asignatura por adelantado para que los estudiantes tengan tiempo de estudiarlo y analizarlo cuando lo necesiten. Y además realizar todos los ajustes necesarios en el formato de los materiales de aprendizaje. Y en cuanto a la evaluación y a la tutoría, optan por una evaluación flexible, abierta, y, eh, en definitiva, que puedan hacerse de diferentes formas, como vamos a ver aquí. Cuando los profesores hablaban de eh, sus experiencias con, con estudiantes con discapacidad visual, eh, recomendaban que se hagan en eh, los materiales didácticos que se utilicen materiales digitales y que sean accesibles. Por ejemplo, que sean compatibles con lectores de, de pantalla que estén preparados con etiquetas de descripción de imágenes y que se utilice la transcripción al braille cuando sea posible. En España, eh, la Fundación OC11 hace una labor excelente en este proceso de, de transcripciones, por ejemplo. En los métodos de, de enseñanza también recomendaban que eh, se intente que el alumno esté cerca del profesor, en la primera fila de clase, no hablar muy lejos del estudiante, facilitar el apoyo por parte de sus compañeros, hacer un trabajo colaborativo, permitir utilizar tecnología asistiva y que permitan grabar las clases en aula. Y la evaluación, además de optar por una evaluación continua, dar más tiempo para la realización de exámenes y permitir cambiar la modalidad. Por ejemplo, había profesores que para los estudiantes con discapacidad visual hacían un examen oral, o un examen por ordenador, o previamente eh, solicitaban su transcripción a, al braille. Para terminar ya, eh, los profesores eh, hacían una serie de recomendaciones para otros docentes universitarios que estén eh, interesados o preocupados por mejorar su enseñanza y hacerla más inclusiva. En primer lugar, informarse sobre sus estudiantes, también acudir a esos servicios de apoyo de las universidades, que son unos grandes desconocidos. Mostrarse abiertos y disponibles, preguntando siempre qué necesita el alumno. Y, sobre todo, valorar las capacidades y el esfuerzo del alumno frente a sus limitaciones. Y, finalmente, eh, también muchos de ellos, muchos de estos profesores, mmm, diseñaban... Eh, su enseñanza, atendiendo los principios del diseño universal de aprendizaje, los, cual, los cuales destacaban para el alumnado con discapacidad visual el principio de múltiples formas de representación, es decir, presentar, utilizar diferentes formatos para los contenidos, audio descriptivos, material audiovisual con audios, 
material en formato digital y múltiples formas de acción y expresión. Es decir, permitir al estudiante que utilice los soportes, y los formatos y los recursos que prefiera para construir sus actividades y, tra y trabajos. En definitiva, eh, dar libertad al alumno para que utilice todo lo que sea necesario y ajustar su enseñanza y sus métodos y sus recursos a todo lo que el alumno necesite. Y eso se obtiene, cuando no se tiene formación sobre todo, se obtiene a raíz de preguntar al alumno qué necesita, cómo podemos hacer que la, que la asignatura sea más sencilla de aprender para ti y en, siguiendo los pasos que el propio alumno le dé al profesor. Espero que os haya resultado interesante el estudio y os agradezco vuestra, vuestra atención. Muchas gracias. Ok, thank you very much, uh, Professor Rabal Carvalho, for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, we just listened to information shared from uh, two different corner of the world, how struggle had been made to make higher education um, access, more accessible for students with visual impairment. First corner is from East Asia region and the other corner is from Europe. Now it's time for me to entertain you with question and answer session. So if you have question, Please, uh, for you who would like to uh, uh, convey your question directly, please raise your hand and open your microphone. And uh, <clears throat> if you would like to share your question in written question, please uh, write your question in chat uh, chatting column. And uh, my colleagues uh, will help me to, my friend will help me to, Uh, read the question. Is there someone who raised hand would like to ask question? We have four participants who have raised their hand. Please. Uh, shall we call Ms. Socorro Quintana, please? Um, yes, please. Uh, and please mention your name and Uh, uh, your question is uh, in to, to whom your question is addressed to. No. Is there any written question in chatting column? There is, uh, yeah, but it's in Spanish. Maybe someone can help us in. Um... Translate it into English. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, several hands has uh, raised. We had Miss Socorro Quintana, Miss um, uh, Steph Stephanie Mary, Anil Aneja, Gabi, Michael Remundo, and Gipari. They raised their, they ha their hand. Maybe they have some questions. Yeah, but, but it's not in English, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> so many, maybe we need to change the. Who? Are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I think. Is, uh, is, is there some, someone who could help us translate the Spain question into English? If Rafael can uh, translate it to us. No? <laughs> yes, I can. I can try. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Uh, let me try. Um, 
they are asking uh, which one are the employees, the jobs, uh, more, uh, more usual for people with visual impairments. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think um, what kind of job uh, is usually done for people with visual impairment? I think uh, hope, hopefully the, my interpretation is correct. So uh, let me ask maybe Marlo from the Philippines answer this question first mm -hmm. and then Fook from Vietnam uh, answer also this question. So we would like to have more information from the Philippines and from the from Vietnam as well. Marlo, please. Hi, Marlo. Can you hear me? Marlo. Okay, Fook, are you here? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? Could you please answer first? Sure. Um... Yes, please. For, for your question, um, as Marlo already mentioned in his presentation about uh, the, pop, the most popular job um, um, that the blind people are working, uh, I think same in Philippines, in Vietnam, we also have the massage uh, jobs are the most popular one. But since uh, we implemented um, the higher education and you know, um, more blind, more visually impaired people attending the university, higher education, so more job opportunities are coming in. Um, for example, um, now many blind um, people working at the, like for example, telesales or customer mm -hmm. support service, um, uh, some kind of online, uh, like, uh, online work, uh, like online marketing or something like that, or even they can do some kind of uh, self business, self-employed business. All right, all right. Uh, um, even I heard that uh, someone from Vietnam currently work as a programmer in Grab Office in Singapore. Is that correct, Fook? Yeah, that's right. Um, when he finished, uh, he finished the university and he's now working as the software engineer at the Apple um, company. Yeah, so yeah. yes, that's 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 fantastic. Uh, it 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 means that um, access to higher education had opened up uh, more job opportunities for younger people with visual impairment in Vietnam. Marlo, Marlo, are you there? Or Ami, maybe could you please uh, answer question? Because my law is raining very hard right now in the uh, area, but yeah. uh, just like in uh, Vietnam, previously most uh, work by um, our friends who are blind or low vision is massage, but um, right now most of them are in um, offices as a call center agent. They have some, some of them, they, they put up their own business. And then um, others are uh, sales, um, psychology, social worker from a government institution. But um, most that I know are from uh, teaching in a, in a government institution. So teaching, social work, psychology, um, uh, inter uh, business, uh, call center, things like that. Yeah, yeah, okay, so. Um, the same as uh, Vietnam. Uh, so now um, young people with visual impairment have more job opportunities to do. And this is because of uh, the result of our effort to make higher education more open to uh, students with visual impairment. I think uh, in my country, in Indonesia also, uh, the situation quite the same that uh, uh, situation uh, is currently developing. <clears throat> we have more young people with visual impairment working in government sectors. And even we have more young people with visual impairment working in companies as um, 
digital content writer, for example, or or uh, telemarketing, telesales, and also they develop their own business as a website developer, for example, or as consultant, uh, accessible technology consultant, also now uh, become more open for people with visual impairment. So hopefully this information answers the question. Thank you. Next, is there any other question? Maybe for, for Professor Rafael? <laughs> is there any question for Professor Rafael in Spain? You can read and please answer the question. <laughs> I think you have uh, another question in English for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Ami, could you please read yes. the English question? Yeah. Uh, um, they want to know how the technology training comes for blind and low vision people uh, went. Okay, about uh, technology training for blind and low vision uh, people. Okay, um, I think um, from your presentation, you have mentioned a little bit, Marlo and Fu. But please, maybe you can add more. Fook, you can add more information on technology training for people with visual impairment in Vietnam. Yeah, um, as uh, in, in, um, in my presentation about the technology training for blind students or visually impaired students, um, we have different groups. Uh, we have different uh, objectives for different um, group of students, for example, uh, we prepared the technology skills for fresh students. I mean that the first year student or high school students, so they can prepare for the entrance into the higher education. And we also have um, um, the trainings, uh, technology trainings for the groups that they are currently enrolled at a university. Um, because we want to update them with the latest technology skills to help them uh, improve um, their academic performance. Um, and the other group that is, um, that is for the job seekers, especially for the students, four year um, students. Uh, I mean that the student at the four year of university program, as well as the graduate students, um, we focus on providing them uh, the technology related skills which uh, the job um, that the job required, you know. So, um, mm -hmm. so we focus on different kind of groups. Yeah, yeah. Do you also provide in job training, uh, which is related with technology? For for example, if someone uh, had been accepted in one company and uh, the company asked uh, the person to upgrade his or her technology skill and then uh, is it possible that so my computer center also provide support uh, for this yeah. need yeah okay. yeah um we, we wish to support for that as well for example we have the on-site training a job training so um mm -hmm. the employers uh, work with us uh, mm -hmm. to arrange such kind of trainings to provide yeah. for their uh, visually impaired employees as well as after after they, 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 they work at the company, uh, we also uh, keep connected with uh, both the employees and the employers. So if they need any consultation or support, um, uh, we, we will provide on time, yeah. Yeah, yeah, all right, thank you. Uh, Ami, could you please uh, add more information about technology training in the Philippines? Um, in the Philippines, we uh, invite young people coming from secondary and college students, incoming college students, to join for a two-week computer eyes camp. Uh, we call it computer eyes. Um, uh -huh. We divide the group into two. There's a basic uh, basic curriculum and then there's an advanced curriculum. For basic uh, curriculum, uh, same content as mentioned by, by Pooh, using computer, 
basically the objective is to uh, develop these skills so that they can access their curriculum, um, their secondary curriculum. Uh, some of the uh, topics include, uh, of course, using PowerPoint because for, for the presentation and accessing um, other um, uh, materials using technology. Then we, ha we have an advanced group. The advanced group is basically for college uh, students and for those who are uh, needing the use of assistive technology to secure um, employment. Um, aside from the use of technology, soft skills are also included in the in the training so that they they, they can actually use the skills on, on using assistive technology and then at the same time the soft skills. And for uh, for in the Philippines, we also use the uh, program by IBM, the Skill Build that focus uh, that um, mainly um, how do you say it mainly consists on soft skills using technology, using okay. technology, and then at the same time, answering questions that relates to develop, developing their self-awareness, their, their other soft skills that they needed for uh, employment, future employment. Mm -hmm. So uh, you add a soft skill within the uh, technology training to make uh, uh, students be more ready to go to find job inclusively. All right, all right, that's interesting. Um, thank you, Ami and Fu, for answering the question. Is there any other question? No more? We still have, uh, I think, uh, about 15 minutes more. If you would like to make use of the time to uh, ask more questions or maybe comment, or maybe uh, you guys would like to share your own experience working with students with visual impairment. In university, I, sorry, Ariane. Yes, please. We have more uh, questions in the chat, so I I'm gonna uh, answer the question for me. Yes, please. Okay. I don't I don't know if the rest of you can read the other questions, and um, all of you can answer the question you you can. Okay. Yes. Yes. So okay. you go. You go first, please. Okay. And and if you let me, I prefer to answer the question in Spanish because if easier for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Please. Please. Okay. Um, hay un, un compañero, eh, Michel Raimundo, que pregunta eh, cómo puede continuar su formación, su su carrera de enseñanza. En, eh, en la universidad, porque es profesor de matemáticas. Bueno, pues eso depende de cada país. Normalmente, eh, para ser profesor universitario, lo que tienes que hacer es unos estudios de doctorado, a PhD, y a partir de ahí ya pues comenzar con, con esa carrera docente e investigadora. Pero la mejor forma para informarte de ello es en, en la propia universidad donde te gustaría continuar esos estudios eh, universitarios de, de posgrado, de, de doctorado, para lo cual te, te animo si te, si te gusta el mundo de la investigación, no solo de la enseñanza, sino, sino también de la investigación. Eh, a ver, ¿alguna otra pregunta eh, para mí? Eh, sí, eh, Sukil dice que eh, en este estudio que he comentado, creo que se refiere al, al mío, eh, indicaba que los docentes decían que se utilizaba la transcripción en braille cuando fuese posible. Y pregunta cuál es el porcentaje de esta uh, causística teniendo en cuenta el auge de lo digital últimamente. Vale, el, las transcripciones a, a braille es verdad que en los últimos años 
normalmente se, se desarrollan, sobre todo, hasta donde tengo conocimiento, sobre todo para eh, pruebas de evaluación, para exámenes. Porque es cierto que eh, cuando mmm, los profesores y los estudiantes tienen el contenido en formato digital, esto facilita mucho la accesibilidad del estudiante con discapacidad visual al material, pudiendo eh, utilizar, por ejemplo, algo tan sencillo como, como un lector de pantalla. ¿no? Y también pues, permitiendo grabar la voz del docente en audio. Pero sí que es verdad que, por ejemplo, aquí en España, pues, me, eh, los estudiantes con discapacidad visual tienen el apoyo de, de tutores en, en, la, en la ONCE y la ONCE sí que des, desarrolla una, un trabajo excelente de transcripción de materiales. Muchas veces la propia universidad o el profesorado solicita esa transcripción, sobre todo, como digo, de, de pruebas de exámenes, pero es verdad que las necesidades de los estudiantes de, de materiales en braille van siendo cada vez menores precisamente por eso que, que comenta el compañero, ¿no? Por, porque tienen el material accesible en formatos digitales. Y no, espero que con eso haya eh, respondido a su pregunta. Y eh, mirando más, más preguntas. Creo que las demás eh, son todas para, para vosotros. Mira, aquí hay otra para mí. ¿Cuál es la licenciatura más cursada en España por personas con discapacidad visual? Pregunta. Eso lo ha preguntado antes, creo que he visto alguna otra pregunta eh, por ahí. Normalmente, al menos en España, eh, es verdad que las personas con discapacidad visual seleccionan eh, eh, carreras, estudios del área de las ciencias sociales, más que, por ejemplo, de eh, ciencias experimentales o enseñanzas técnicas. Es decir, donde mayor eh, número de estudiantes con discapacidad visual tenemos, hay, es en ciencias sociales, por ejemplo, en carreras de educación, carreras de economía, incluso de, de derecho, legislación, eh, de, de filologías, carreras de filología, es decir, todo lo que tiene que ver con las ciencias sociales y las humanidades. Hay un, un menor número de estudiantes en carreras, por ejemplo, como ingeniería, matemáticas o, o ciencias de la salud, ¿no? normalmente. Pero, evidentemente, pues, tenemos también estudiantes con discapacidad visual que estudian, por ejemplo, medicina en España. Eh, a ver, otra para mí. <ríe> vale, pregunta si hay eh, algún currículum o programa completo para enseñar a los profesores de la universidad para enseñar eh, o desarrollar clases inclusivas. Eh, no, en España, como en otros muchos países, el problema del profesorado universitario es que no se le exige una formación pedagógica obligatoria. Es decir, comentaba antes el caso de la necesidad de un doctorado, de un PhD, y es precisamente esa la dificultad. Los, encontramos a un profesorado eh, muy capacitado para la investigación, pero muy poco capacitado para la enseñanza. Entonces, el, el problema es que eh, la formación, el hecho de recibir formación en educación in inclusiva y en atención a estudiantes con discapacidad es una cuestión mm, voluntaria y depende del de interés de cada profesor. Con lo cual, ahí entra en juego eh, cuestiones de eh, la personalidad del propio docente y eh, eh, el interés que tenga por, por sus estudiantes. El docente que quiere mejorar va a recibir formación de manera, eh, de manera libre, porque lo va a elegir. El docente que no le interesa, pues no va a tener ninguna formación para atender a los estudiantes con discapacidad. Y ese es precisamente el problema que nos encontramos en, en la universidad. Um, okay. I think it's all right. all, everything for yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, to add more information about 
uh, ICGI uh, higher education program in East Asia region, especially in seven countries where the project has been implemented for years. Uh, actually, um, ICPI has two international partners in the region to empower students with visual impairment. Uh, firstly, is the Nippon Foundation, and the second one is Overbrook International Program, which uh, before we we usually call it ONNET, Overbrook Nippon Network on Education Technology. So with uh, these two partners, uh, collaboration and cooperation in the region, we, we succeeded to empower students with visual impairment with technology skill, access to universities, and empower parents, teachers, as our colleagues just uh, presented. And also the unique thing of uh, our collaboration in East Asia region is before the pandemic, annually we have co country coordinator meeting, which um, discuss a program supported by those two uh, ICFI international partners, the Nippon Foundation, as well as uh, ONNET or Overbrook international program. Uh, within this uh, country coordinator uh, meeting, usually um, the country coordinators share their experience and learn each other. So we make progress uh, all together. Even um, if a country has uh, strength in one area, other countries uh, are able to learn from uh, this country who, who has uh, uh, advanced in particular area. For example, RBI is or have uh, strength in developing um, learning strategy in STEM, for example. So other countries could also learn from RBI uh, how to develop um, accessible learning strategy for students with visual impairment in STEM. And uh, folk just also presented in, the, in Vietnam, with uh, Sao Mai Computer Center also help uh, our colleagues in Myanmar to, to have uh, the Burmese TTS. This is also very strong collaboration between two country partners uh, to support our our friends in Myanmar, so they have their own, they have TTS in their own language currently. Okay, is there any more question for uh, Philippines and Vietnam? We have, I think, five minutes more before we end this session. Ami, is there any question? For you and Fu? <laughs> uh, yes. I see, I see many comments. Uh, <laughs> no more. Uh, uh, this is from Miss Moni. Uh -huh. Hi, I just want to know how can you help your sighted mathematics, mathematics professor with the right approach of teaching or explaining your mathematics subject if you are blind, if you are a blind student. Okay. The question is for RBI, I think. <laughs> 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 yes, I will please answer the question. <laughs> and perhaps Fook also, if you have experience on that, you can add more then. Please, Ami. Um, we in the Philippines we usually, as mentioned earlier by Mr. Lucas, we usually provide um, training for college professors as to how they can accommodate uh, students with visual impairment in their university. Um, recently, the focus of the training is on. Um, modifying their teaching strategies, providing accommodation and um, 
modification to access mathematic curriculum. So we have introduced the um, um, materials produced by ICEBI, uh, Mathematics Made Easy, which you can actually download through the website of ICEBI, uh, icebi.org. You can, you can download that. And we usually provide that materials to the teachers. Um, it's, anyway, it's for free. You can just download it. Now, ICEBI also um, share some videos as to actually how you can how you can see the adaptations or modification made by um, teachers so that blind students can access or understand the math concept, which is um, very abstract for someone like me. We also <laughs> provide uh, videos for, for the professors. Uh, aside from the available materials from ICEBI, we also produce some videos which includes testimonies of um, professors who are actually teaching mathematics for regular students with a, a blind student in the classroom. So that's that's how we do it in, in the Philippines, but maybe Pook can also provide additional information. Pook? Yeah. Pook, yeah. If you have yeah. experience, please. Uh, I, I think I just, um, because um, I, I mean already mentioned about the ICVI, um, uh, math documents that is a very useful uh, resource um, for the sighted mathematics uh, mm -hmm. teachers. Um, and um, but on, also one point that because we had a uh, one uh, blind student studying mathematics at the university, and I think besides um, how to do uh, how to talk to the uh, to the university faculties, but I think that uh, the students. Uh, should cooperate uh, cooperate more with their mathematic professors. Uh, uh, let them know and uh, maybe request them to uh, to provide the materials in advance, um, so the blind students can have more time to prepare or to convert it into accessible formats uh, to read. Um, because same in Vietnam, many many uh, prof mathematic uh, math math professors that would understand how to convey the mathematical concepts for the blind students, especially in the higher education um, program. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Fook and uh, Ami. Maybe I can a little bit at uh, what is currently happening in Indonesia, also, um, supported by ICPI and Offerbrook International Program. In Indonesia, uh, we have a resource center named Mitra Netra Foundation. This resource center developed guideline book on math learning strategy for students with visual impairment. And this guideline book is used for math regular teachers from grade one until grade 12. In this guideline book, um, uh, the books provide information how um, teachers should develop particular strategy if it is needed to teach math concept to students with visual impairment in regular classroom, included how to uh, develop a low cost, uh, teaching material, for example, and uh, the book is were were designed um, as simple as possible to be easily read or understood even by math regular teachers in remote areas. Besides that, um, Mitra Netra Foundation also developed mathematics software named Math MBC. This software has two functions. Firstly, uh, it could be used to produce math braille books for students. And the second one, uh, this software could be used as uh, a bridge, communication bridge between students with visual impairment who need to work with their computer in doing math. Uh, and math regular teachers who could not read Braille. So by the usage of this software, they could uh, read 
uh, the work or assignments done by students with visual impairment in, in doing their math assignments uh, with the uses of this software. At the same time, uh, Mitra Netra Foundation also developed cooperation with the Ministry of Education and Provincial Government Agency on Education to provide um, uh, in-service uh, uh, in uh, training for math regular teachers. Uh, and, and the next step for uh, this foundation is now uh, start developing is that they develop also cooperation with uh, the universities who has who have a uh, math uh, training department. So um, the cooperation is the, the purpose of the cooperation is to insert the topic of math learning strategy for students with visual impairment within the curriculum of uh, math teacher training department. So students, uh, university students who, who are learning in uh, math uh, teacher training department, we uh, should be able, should, should know in advance that uh, when they have students with visual impairment in the future, they know already how to modify the uh, uh, teaching or learning process for their students with visual impairment. So they are not they are not confused anymore if they have to handle or face students with visual impairment. For university students, blind university students, when they have uh, math in regular classroom, usually in Indonesia, the professor provide them with uh, extra coaching uh, to to have more, more time for the blind student to, to, to understand or to learn the math concept or the resource centers are the one who provide the uh, extra coaching for university students, as well as um, students from high school and uh, elementary school. Oh, okay, everybody. I think uh, our time is up now. Um, we have finished our session. Thank you for all the speakers, uh, Ami Mojika and Marlo Lucas from, from RBI, the Philippines, Dang Hui Fu, uh, Executive Director of Somai Computer Center, Vietnam, and Professor Rafael Carballo from Spain. Thank you for your time to share your experience and achievement in the area of higher education for students with visual impairment. Uh, I do hope that this session is uh, very, very fruitful for you who are participate in and, and please enjoy the rest of the World Blindness Summit that uh, will still going on until uh, end of June. This is the first virtual global event conducted uh, for people with visual impairment and, their, and the supporters in many areas that need to be discussed, need to be shared. And let's make this uh, event, global virtual event be very successful and we can uh, speak our voice uh, louder to the world that people with visual impairment are here in the world. The number of people with visual impairment is not, it's not, not little, not few. We have many about 285 million uh, based on WHO uh, database. And many, uh, most of them living in uh, developing countries where uh, education system are still underdeveloped. So let's work together, work together hand in hand to make uh, schools and university to become more inclusive for everybody to study, including for our students with visual impairment. As the moderator of this session, I would like to once again thank 
to you all for participating in this session. See you next in the in the other session with uh, other interesting topics. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Ami, Fu. Thank you, Aria. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rafael. Yeah. Sorry.